Hello and welcome to the launch of the 2024 Lancet Countdown in Europe report. It's a pleasure to have you all here with us today. Before we start, we're just going to go through some housekeeping. So just to let you know, the event is being recorded and you can submit any uh, questions through the Q&A. And it'd be great if you could keep yourself muted during the event. And if you would like, closed captions are available in English. Okay, so we'll make a start. Um, I'm Professor Rachel Lowe. I'm an ICREA researcher at the Barcelona Supercomputing Center leading the Global Health Resilience Group. I'm also the director of the Lancet Countdown in Europe. And it's my great pleasure to welcome our first keynote speaker, uh, Dr. Hans Kluger. So Dr. Dr. Hans Kluger is the WHO Regional Director for Europe. Uh, before joining the WHO in 1999, he worked for Médecins Sans Frontières. And over the years, he has specialized in TB and HIV and has experience working in um, Liberia, Somalia, Russia, North Korea, and Myanmar. So thank you very much and welcome. Thank you. Distinguished colleagues and friends, the impressive 2024 Europe report of the Lancet Countdown is the latest assessment of a unique mechanism to track climate health indicators. And it's yet another wake up call. While some progress has been made since 2022, today's trends are deeply concerning. Several indicators are moving in the wrong direction. Heat-related deaths are increasing. Climate suitability for various climate-sensitive pathogens and vectors has increased. And the pace at which countries are moving towards net zero remains, and I quote, woefully inadequate. The European region is warming at twice the global rate, translating into extreme weather events with direct and indirect consequences for human health. Unfortunately, our health systems remain suboptimally equipped to handle this challenge. As noted in the report, national adaptation plans are often lacking or implemented only partially. Integration of the health sector with other sectors like agriculture, water, and urban planning is also suboptimal. And comprehensive vulnerability assessments at the national level remain scarce. However, there is hope. The first meeting of the European Partnership for Health Sector Climate Action takes place today, driven by a group of pioneering countries led by Ireland aiming to create a community of practice to address the gaps highlighted in the Lancet Countdown Report and support countries in fulfilling their commitments made in Budapest last year at the 7th Ministerial Conference on Environment and Health. The upcoming 77th World Health Assembly plans to adopt a new resolution to mainstream climate action across the public health agenda and also to be reflected in WHO's new 14th Global Program of Work and the European Program of Work. The 29th UN Climate Change Conference taking place this year in our region, in Azerbaijan, will be another milestone in advocating for bolder and faster health sector action and that the WHO, we are working closely with the COP29 presidency to ensure that. I want to express my most sincere appreciation for this strategic partnership between the WHO Regional Office for Europe and Lancet Countdown, which provides us with robust and much needed regional data and is paramount to creating a critical mass of support and evidence-informed guidance for countries to act upon. Together with the scientific and policy-making communities, including the European Commission and its European Climate and Health Observatory, this partnership will help 
WHO member states achieve climate resilient health systems, integrating climate considerations into all aspects of public health work. Together, we can safeguard the health of our communities. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Hans Kluger. We're incredibly great, grateful for your partnership and all the support you've provided to the Lancet Countdown in Europe. So I'll now introduce the next keynote speaker. Uh, Dr. Mar Marina Romanello is the Executive Director of the Lancet Countdown and a climate change and health researcher at University College London. Welcome, Marina. Hi everyone, thank you so much Rachel, thank you so much everyone for joining the event. I'm beyond delighted to be here at the launch of the second indicator report of the Lancet Countdown in Europe. Um, the product of the work and dedication of the, the Lancet Countdown in Europe team, particularly Kim Van Dalen and, and Rachel Lowe, who put an enormous amount of work in this report and we're very proud of seeing it coming together. I'm the executive director of the Lancet Countdown, that is the, the Lancet Countdown collaboration as a whole. And as many of you might know, the Lancet Countdown is a global academic effort that brings together today almost 300 researchers from around the world with the purpose of producing rigorous scientific evidence of the evolving links between health and climate change. This is done under the understanding, the understanding that climate change is the biggest global health threat of the century but also that the actions that we need to take to tackle climate change could deliver transformative health opportunities today in every country. The launch of this report is part of a, um, an effort of the Lancet Countdown to delve a bit deeper into different world regions and see what is happening locally with climate change and health. Recently, we published the Lancet Countdown report for Latin America and for Oceania. We'll publish also soon one for small island developing states. We published the report for Asia last year, and we're hoping to expand our efforts with more and increased support from the Wellcome Trust, and you'll get some news on that soon. But last year in 2023, November, ahead of the COP28 climate negotiations, we published the Global Lancet Countdown Report. What that report showed us um, through our regional analysis is that Europe is very vulnerable to the impacts of climate change. Europe, if we compare with other world regions, has the highest mortality rate uh, from extreme heat exposure. It also is the world region that has um, the fastest growing uh, emergence of infectious disease risk transmission for climate sensitive infectious diseases like dengue and malaria. It also is heavily affected by extreme weather events. So it's an area that requires a lot of action as you just heard in terms of adaptation to cope with the growing threats of climate change. But Europe is also one of the biggest contributors to global greenhouse gas emissions. And with that, it is crucial for the transformation, not only for Europe, but globally towards a healthier future. And looking a bit deeper into this, we also found that Europe is the region with the most death per 100,000 from air pollution that comes from the burning of fossil fuels. It also is the world region with the highest rate of mortality from unhealthy, high carbon diets that are low in rich plant-based foods and very high in meat and dairy products. And it's a region that heavily subsidizes still fossil fuels. So Europe has an enormous opportunity for the transformation um, to, a, to a healthier low carbon um, system that could deliver immediate health benefits to European peoples today. You will hear now a lot more into what is actually happening in Europe through a deep dive that has been led by the Lancet Countdown in Europe through this new report. And we hope that the evidence that we're providing with this report can be useful to decision makers, to those that work in the health system, to those that have capacity to deliver adaptation and mitigation efforts, as well as to every individual in taking individual action to tackle climate change. Because to, today, what we're seeing from this report, loud and clear, is that we still have an enormous opportunity to deliver a healthy future, tackling one of the, some of the biggest um, determinants of health in Europe, and obviously forging a, a, very, a better future for, for all by tackling climate change. 
I hope you will enjoy the event. I hope you will uh, listen to the findings that Rachel and Kim are going to present. And I thank you all so much for your attention. And please do take a look into the other uh, regional reports of the Lancet countdown that are uh, really painting a very, very uh, concerning picture globally and a lot of opportunities for action. Thank you very much. And back to you, Rachel. Thank you so much, Marina. Okay, well, thank you very much, Marina, for, for setting the scene of the, um, the global Lancet countdown and with a focus on Europe and the threats facing our region. So it's my great pleasure to start the presentation of the 2024 Europe report of the Lancet Countdown on Health and Climate Change, entitled Unprecedented Warming Demands Unprecedented Action. So I'll first provide a bit of background about our collaboration, um, how it emerged and has grown, and then I'll pass over to Dr. Kim Van Dallen, who will take us through the findings of this year's report. So as we know, um, the Lancet Countdown um, has been is a global collaboration with over 300 uh, authors across the world. And we have been publishing reports um, led by uh, University College London for several years and really framing the problem that climate change <clears throat> doesn't have to be the biggest threat of the 21st century. It can be the biggest public health opportunity because any action that we take to protect our health, to, to mitigate climate change, can in fact be very beneficial to our health. So there has been a series of uh, reports uh, published um, over the last few years. Um, the last report was uh, in 2023, with a particular focus on the differences across uh, the regional areas. And the Lancet Countdown family has grown over the last few years, and there are now a series of different regional centers. So I've been leading the Lancet Countdown in Europe uh, for the last three years. Um, and we've been publishing reports alongside the other uh, regional centers. We can see here a snapshot of some of the, the latest reports that have been published by the Lancet Countdown Oceana, Latin America, and um, Asia Center. So the Lancet Countdown in Europe was established in uh, 2021. So Kim Van Dallen and I have been leading the collaboration from the Barcelona Supercomputing Center in collaboration with partners at the Barcelona Institute for Global Health and 40 other institutions across Europe. Um, we, are, we have uh, great support from the chair and co-chair of the collaboration, Professor Maria Nilsson and Professor Josette Marie Anton. And we've had uh, support from uh, Dr. Uh, Professor Catherine Tonne as the um, co-director. And we have a series of working group uh, leads who have been leading on the different working groups of the Lancet Countdown across impacts, adaptation, mitigation and co-benefits, economics and finance and political engagement. Um, we also um, are greatly supported by our partners at the uh, WHO European office and by Marina and her team at UCL in the Global Center. So the Lancet Countdown in Europe is structured in a, in a similar way to the global collaboration. <clears throat> We're tracking uh, impacts, um, adaptation, mitigation, economics and finance, and um, engagement in uh, political um, social engagement. And we currently have um, pulled together 32 indicators to track the progress of um, health and climate change across Europe or the lack of uh, meaningful action to protect the health of Europeans and the health of everyone across the globe. So since uh, the launch of the Lancet Countdown in Europe, we've published uh, several reports and commentaries. We first published a, uh, a scoping outlining uh, piece in September 2021. In October 2022, we published our first indicator report, including 33 indicators from 44 researchers across Europe. And uh, just last night, we published the second indicator report, 
including 42 indica indicators from si uh, 69 researchers. So the collaboration is growing and we're continually adding uh, new evidence to help decision makers across Europe understand and prepare appropriate actions to deal with the threat of climate change on health in Europe. We've also uh, published a series of commentaries reflecting on the challenges of uh, tracking aspects of um, inequ uh, equity and justice um, through the, the approach followed in the Lancet countdown. And today um, we're delighted to present to you the latest findings, which also include aspects of inequity and justice. So as well as publishing our findings um, in the Lancet Public Health, we're incredibly grateful to the entire Lancet Public Health team for um, helping us disseminate our research uh, widely in such a prestigious journal. We also provide our, our indicators um, to the European Climate and Health Observatory, which is a partnership of um, many partners um, across Europe, including the European Commission, the European Centre for Disease Control, the WHO European Centre and many other partners. And here um, we provide a series of indicators to the observatory, which allows users to be able to interrogate and understand the data and assess uh, regional and national differences. We also uh, provide evidence for a series of different policy reports uh, there will be a report uh, published today um, reflecting on um, the policy priorities uh, for Europe. We have contributed to uh, indicator, uh, we've contributed indicators to reports published by um, the European Environment Agency, and we'll also be um, contributing to a report that will be launched by the EEA um, this Wednesday. We have um, produced a series of materials to help, help disseminate the findings of this year's uh, report, including uh, 42 different um, infographics describing each of our indicators with a selection of those translated into Spanish, French and German. So please do get in touch and email uh, Kim Van Dalen if you would like access to these infographics to disseminate them through your platforms. So I now have the great pleasure of passing over to Dr. Kim Van Dalen. Kim is the driving force of the Lancet Countdown in Europe. She has done an incredible job leading both the scientific and organizational aspects of the collaboration. I'm incredibly grateful to Kim. It's been a pleasure working with Kim for the last three years. Um, Kim is also a postdoctoral researcher at the Global Health Resilience Group at the Barcelona Supercomputing Center and I will now pass over to Kim to delve into the findings of the 2024 report. Thank you. Okay. Sorry for the hiccup. I'm just going to reshare my screen again. It's a bit tricky when you're both doing things behind the scenes that are also supposed to be talking, um, but it is working. Uh, give me one second. Okay, we are back. Um, thank you so much to Rachel for the lovely introduction. I'm excited to be able to highlight some of the findings of a report with you today. Um, like Rachel mentioned, our indicator report this year has 42 different indicators. So if we discuss the results of all of these indicators, we're still here in a couple of hours. So what I will do instead is highlight some of our findings and encourage you to have a look at our full report um, after this um, event. But first, before we dive into the results of our new report, I want to go back two years when our very first indicator report was published. And in this indicative report, we already showed that there were upward trends in heat-related hazards, exposures, vulnerabilities, and risk from climate change, and there was a lack of sufficiently ambitious adaptation and mitigation strategies in Europe. And you can see that when you look at this figure that is highlighting some of our impact indicators, as well as some of our response indicators, where the impact indicators are gradually getting worse over time, and there are some improvements in the response indicators, but far from where we would like it to be. 
This year, we have gone from 33 indicators to 42 indicators, which is a lot more than before. But we also have tried to highlight more different aspects of how um, different groups within Europe may differ in terms of risks, vulnerabilities, exposures, et cetera. So something that we uh, highlight is how, for example, in Southern Europe, people are experiencing different risks than in Northern Europe or Western Europe. And where we are able to, because we're very dependent on, of course, uh, the quality of our data, we also have looked at climate and health associations for specific population groups. So for example, differences between men and women, differences between high and low income groups, um, et cetera. Um, as well as trying to highlight more what specifically the role of Europe has been in the climate crisis as one of the historical and current biggest emitters of greenhouse gas emissions. The indicators that we published in the 2024 report follow a similar structure as uh, the Lancet countdown in general. So I will highlight uh, some of the indicators of each in these, of these different teams. And at the end of the presentation, I will provide you an overall summary of the key messages that our report gives you um, and then we will go to the panel discussion. So for each of the different uh, teams, I will first present you with a slide like this that is highlighting all of the indicators that we have within that specific section. And if you look here, you see some of them are highlighted in green. And these are the indicators that are completely new to this report or either have a sub indicator that is new to that general indicator. So in this section, we include 14 different indicators that track impacts, exposure and vulnerabilities from rising temperatures, extreme weather and climatic events, climate sensitive infectious diseases, allergens and food insecurity. And you can see here some of the ones that we have newly added in this year. So highlighting some of the indicators in a report, I wanted to start with discussing uh, physical activity, because we know that regular physical activity is a key component of a healthy and sustainable lifestyle. But exercising in hot weather poses a risk of health-related illnesses such as heat exhaustion or heat stroke. And faced with heat, physical activity may either be suppressed, meaning that people don't engage in physical activity anymore, or delayed into cooler parts of the day. And in this indicator, we try to assess the evolving diurnal patterns during which there is heat stress risk undergoing when we are undergoing physical activity unless risk reducing actions are taken. And when we look at the findings of these results, we see that heat stress risk during physical activity has increased beyond the hottest part of the day in each of the different regions. So when you look at this figure here, you see that um, the most recent time period is depicted in red, the time period before that in orange, and the time period before that in blue. And you see that there's more and more risky hours during the day for heat stress risk when we are engaging in physical activity, like playing tennis, football, or biking. We also have an indicator that is tracking heat-related mortality. We know that in 2022, warming since the latter half of the 19th century was almost uh, one degree higher in Europe than the corresponding global increase, with 2022 summer estimates estimating that there were about 60,000 heat-related premature deaths. And with ongoing global warming, climate projections for Europe suggest that there will be a progressive reduction in cold-related deaths and a simultaneously increase in heat-related deaths, with a recent 2021 study indicating that heat-related deaths have already started to exceed reductions in cold-related deaths around 2010. And this indicator uses RF5 land temperature data together with Eurostat mortality data to compute the change in heat related mortality between two time periods, namely 2003 to 2012 and 2013 to 2020. Um, and it shows that heat attributable mortality increased by 17.2 deaths per 100,000 inhabitants in Europe during the last decade comparing to the previous decade. And this increase in heat-related mortality was almost twice as high in women, which we can see here on the right, as that it was compared to men, which we can see here on the left. One of our other in case indicators is focusing on wildfire smoke. We know that exposure to wildfire smoke is associated with an increased risk of mortality and morbidity. And while European fire control and management have improved since pre-industrial times, fire hazards from anthropogenic climate change and epidemiological and demographic trends threaten to increase the health burden from forest fire smoke. And in this indicator, we track climate-driven change in wildfire danger using the fire weather index estimated changes in annual population weighted exposure to wildfire smoke, and we estimated that's attributable to wildfire smoke. And then when we look at the findings, we see that while there are clear positive trends in wildfire danger, which you can see here, 
their wildfire smoke exposure did not show any clear trends, which you can see here. The most affected countries in terms of both wildfire smoke as well as wildfire danger and attributable mortality were both in Southern and Eastern Europe. And differences in trends in wildfire smoke compared to wildfire danger, like we saw here, uh, which are especially evident in countries with large fire danger increases, such as Spain, Portugal, and Bulgaria, may reflect effective wildfire preparedness adaptation and management. So this difference between uh, wildfire danger and wildfire smoke exposure may be um, explained by adaptation. One of our other new indicators this year is tracking the climatic suitability for leishmaniasis. Leishmaniasis is a climate sensitive zoonotic disease that is caused by leishmaniasis parasite and transmitted by female scent flies. Um, parts, I mean, parts of Europe, this disease is currently uh, endemic and scent fly species tend to be located in regions with periodic temperatures that are above 15 degrees, although the optimum climatic conditions for the factor activity may vary between different species. Um, under future climate change, many sandfly species are expected to further expand their range in Europe. And with this indicator, we used a nested machine learning modeling approach to predict the climatic suitability for leishmaniasis across NOTS tree regions. And NOTS tree regions are small administrative units within um, Europe, so you can see all these different uh, regions, which is a NOTS tree region. And what we see is that the number and spatial distribution of NOTS tree regions predicted to be suitable for leishmaniasis have increased considerably when we compare the first part of the data with the second part of the data. So when we compare uh, 2011 to 2020 with 2001 to 20. 2010, uh, we see a considerable increase. And you can see that as well when you look at this figure, um, the countries that are lined with blue are countries that uh, have leishmaniasis endemically present. If you look at the lightest pink, it was suitable only in the first time period, which is only parts of Turkey. Then there are a bit more pink. Uh, they were suitable in both areas, but then there are a few areas that are only suitable in the most recent time period, which is showing that new location locations are becoming suitable north of the historical endemic zone. So this increased suitability was predominantly in Southern Europe and parts of Western and Eastern Europe. One of our other new indicators is focusing on food security and nutrition. In Europe, food insecurity has been linked to negative health outcomes, including a reduced ability to manage chronic diseases and worsening child health. Some demographic groups are at higher risk of being food insecure, including women, older people, people with existing health conditions and low income households. And this indicator combines food insecurity experience scale data um, and income data with frequency of heatwave days and drought months in 37 countries to track the effects of increasing frequency of heat waves and droughts on the prevalence of moderate or severe food insecurity. And what we saw is that in 2021, nearly 60 million people suffered from moderate to severe food insecurity in Europe. And of those, 11.9 million can be attributed to a higher number of heat wave days and drought months compared to 1981 to 2010. Going into the next um, indica indicator team, um, which is focusing on adaptation planning and resilience for health, indicators in this section track climate risk assessment at an international and city level and cross-sectional collaboration for climate adaptation, as well as the implementation of climate-informed surveillance and health early warning systems. These indicators also track adaptation strategies that are used to prevent harmful exposures to high temperatures, such as the use of air conditioning and more sustainable strategies, such as um, an increase in green space or other nature-based solutions. And of course, we know that within Europe, we have one of the world's highest densities of urban settlements, and therefore city level adaptation and mitigation is crucial to build climate resilience. In this indicator, we use data from the Carbon Disclosure Project and the International Council for Local Environment Initiative to show that in 2022, 149 of 185 responding European cities were reported to have conducted a climate and risk assessment. 12 of the 12 reported that an assessment was in progress and about 22 reported that an assessment will be undertaken in the next two years. There's also several health issues that they identified as most relevant for their uh, city, which included heat-related illnesses, the exacerbation of respiratory diseases, 
direct physical, physical injury and death due to extreme events, mental health impacts, as well as health service provision. And they also identified several populations that are most at risk, which include older people, at-risk health groups, children and youth, low-income households, outdoor workers, marginalized communities, women and girls, frontline workers, and indigenous people. Going to the next team, this team is specifically focused on what Europe is doing in terms of mitigation. And we know that global progress on climate change mitigation has been inadequate, with the pace of change being far from what is required to meet the Paris Agreement targets. And we also saw that during the COP28, we only resulted with a vague call for a transition away from fossil fuels instead of the very much needed fossil fuel phase out. In this section, we include nine different indicators that track the European efforts to mitigate climate change by reducing greenhouse gas emissions and their associated health code benefits from the reduction of air pollution related mortality to the transition towards more sustainable and healthy forms of travel and diets. So we know that energy systems remain the largest single source of greenhouse gas emissions. And using data from the International Energy Agency, this indicator showed that while Europe is making some progress towards achieving net zero emissions, its current trajectory is consistent with achieving carbon neutrality only by 2100, which you can see visibly here. We also saw that in 2021, the combustion of fossil fuel amounted to 3.4 billion tons of CO2 per year, which was about 5.4 tons CO2 per person in Europe. And this is six times higher than the Africa, African per capita emissions and 2.7 times higher than Central and South American emissions. When we look at trends in air pollution, um, we know that the exposure to fine particles, particles or PM2.5 is a risk factor for premature mortality, respiratory and cardiovascular disease, adverse pregnancy outcomes, cancer, diabetes, and neurological disorders. And this indicator tra tracks the changes in premature mortality attributable to PM2.5 from the combustion of coal, liquids, uh, fossil fuels, across residential, power generation, and transport economic sectors. In the findings, we see that during 2005 to 2020, um, PM2.5 attributable deaths from fossil fuel combustion have decreased by 59% in Europe overall. However, a lot of this decrease was due to air pollution control technologies that decrease PM2.5, but not necessarily greenhouse gas emissions. So there's lots of co-benefits that are missed out on here. One of the new indicators that we have added this year as well is focusing specifically on health sector emissions and harms. We know that health systems are a substantial source of greenhouse gas emissions and air pollution. And the largest healthcare emissions are related to things as supply chain, including medical product manufacturing, transport, use and disposal, and energy. But of course, following the duty of doing no harm, healthcare institutions should lead the way towards decarbonization. In this indicator, we show that in the World Health Organization European region, the health sector contributed approximately 340 megaton CO2 equivalent in greenhouse gas emissions in 2020, and this is about 356 kilogram CO2 equivalent per person. This was a 3% per capita increase compared to 2001 to 2010. Sorry. Um, however, high quality healthcare, when we use life expectancy as a proxy, can be achieved with lower per capita emissions. So when we look at this figure, we see on this axis the per capita health sector greenhouse gas emissions and on this axis, the healthy life expectancy at birth. And we see that there are a lot of countries that have a healthy, a high life expectancy and still have low per capita healthcare sector emissions. We also see in this indicator that regional air pollution related to European healthcare was estimated to result in an additional 540,000 disability adjusted life years in 2020 alone. Moving on uh, to the next theme, which is focusing on economics and finance. We know that the economic costs of climate change are expected to be substantial, but uncertain. Some emission scenarios are pointing to very high economic costs, and this includes increased healthcare costs, as well as a loss of labor productivity due to heat stress. And this section explores health links, economic impacts of climate change, as well as, as well as the general economic dimension of the transition to zero carbon economies. So placing adequate carbon prices 
can internalize the cost of climate change in economic decision making and set economic incentives for transitioning to, uh, towards a decarbonized economy. However, many European governments continue to subsidize fossil fuels and lack carbon border adjustment mechanisms, increasing levels of health harming emissions. When we look in this indicator, we saw that in 2020, 32, 32 of the 53 World Health Organization European region countries analyzed had carbon pricing mechanisms in place, and 29 of these countries had net negative carbon prices, which means that they were providing net subsidies for fossil fuels and only 14 countries had net positive carbon prices, which means that they are discouraging fossil fuels. And in total, when we look at the whole of Europe again, there are net fossil fuel subsidies of still 61.6 6 billion in 2020. We know as well that implementation and mitigation Policies that address the health dimensions of climate change rely on the political environment in which different actors and institutions across society engage with climate change and health. So that is precisely what this team is tracking. It is tracking how different actors in the climate change and health space are engaging with climate and health. So this section tracks seven indicators assessing climate and health engagement in the scientific community among individuals, primarily through the engagement on Twitter, um, among governments, and politicians um, at an EU level as well as at the national level. It also looks at the corporate sector as well as at media outlets. And considering the European uh, elections are up soon, I think it's useful to specifically highlight the engagement of the European Parliament with health and climate change. The legislative and budgetary powers of the European Parliament and its role in providing guidelines to member states and environmental and health policies makes it a key actor in shaping EU climate change policies. So this indicator tracks political engagement with health and climate change at an EU 27 level by assessing the references to climate change and health related terms in the speeches of legislators in the European Parliament. Um, and we track this between 2014 and 2022. And overall, when we look at this figure, we see the total numbers, numbers of references to health, climate change, and their intersection by country in the European Parliament over this time period. Overall, when there were about over 800 references to climate change in the legislative speeches in 2022, and over 1400 references to health, there were only 10, which is 0.1% references to the intersection of health and climate change in the parliament. And only two of those 10 also had one mention or a mention to inequality, justice, or inequity. So bringing all of the results uh, of our report together in, in one summary, um, the negative climate related health impacts and responsibility for climate change are of course not equal within Europe or across the globe, often reflecting socioeconomic inequalities as well as marginalization. Looking within European countries, we are seeing the most disadvantaged communities being particularly affected by climate related health impacts. And our report shows as well that sub regionally, Southern Europe tends to be more affected by things as heat related illnesses, wildfires, food insecurity, drought, mosquito borne diseases, and leishmaniasis. Whilst in contrast, Northern Europe is equally or more impacted by VPRO and ticks, and the latter, which can spread diseases like Lyme and tick borne encephalitis. At the same time, while we see all these disproportionate impacts within European communities itself, European countries themselves offshore the health impacts of poor consumption elsewhere, with other parts of the world experiencing local air pollution and greenhouse gas emissions as a result of the goods and services that are consumed here in Europe. Looking at our report overall, it shows clearly that the climate crisis is already happening. It is not a far in the future scenario. A report provides evidence on the alarming increases in climate related health trends across Europe, including heat related mortality, emerging infectious diseases and food and water insecurity. Yet the signs of political action to protect citizens are still slim. Many European countries remain major contributors to greenhouse gas emissions and still provide net fossil fuel subsidies, despite the health harms. Failure to take decisive action may exacerbate the existing climate change impacts and lead to missed opportunities for considerable health co-benefits in the short term. Limiting global warming to less than 1.5 degrees through a just and healthy transition would deliver life-saving benefits for people across Europe and beyond. 
Instead of facing ill health and threatening our livelihoods, European countries could feel the health benefits of clean air, better diets, reduced inequality, and more livable cities through, through urgently implementing climate policies which focus on health, well-being, and equity. And with that, I am going to thank all our amazing collaborating institutions um, and everyone that has contributed to the report, all the 69 different co-authors that worked on different indicators um, that you have seen a glimpse of um, in my presentation just now. And with that, I would like to thank you as the audience as well. And I highly recommend having a look at the full report, which you can scan the QR code up here as well. And of course, uh, thanking Idea Alert, Catalyze and Welcome who are contributing to our collaboration. Thank you so much. I'm looking forward to the panel discussion that is upcoming and feel free to ask any questions that you have in the Q&A or in the chats. Thank you very much, Kim. That was a fantastic summary of a very worrying and concerning set of findings about the impacts of climate change on health, but there is hope. And if we start to take uh, concerted action to really mitigate the impacts of climate change, then we can provide big health um, opportunities. So I'd now like to pass over to Arthur Wines, who is going to chair the panel discussion. Um, Arthur is a climate and health advisor for the COP28 presidency, where he leads an international diplomatic work stream on climate and health. Thank you very much, Arthur. Thanks so much, Rachel, uh, and good, uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Arthur, uh, and I'm indeed the health advisor to the COP28 presidency. And, and thanks so much. It was really helpful to hear those presentations from, from Marina, Rachel and Kim on the latest countdown reports, and especially interesting to learn about um, sort of several of the new indicators that have, have now been added. Uh, the report is now published online, so I would highly recommend that you get yourself a, a copy and take the time today or this week to sort of read through the report and to digest it, because what we just heard was quite a lot to digest. Um, but to help to get us started, we have five incredible panelists with us today, so some of which are authors on the report, all of which are experts on climate health, uh, and so they'll help us make sense of it all, help place some of the findings of the report in their in our current political context. And so I have prepared a few questions I would like to add, uh, ask uh, each of the speakers first to get us started, um, and which will also allow me to introduce each of them uh, one by one. Uh, and after that, I'll open the floor for any questions that, that you might have from the audience. So like Kim said, please uh, do think of any questions you might want to ask them and, and feel free to pop them in the chat. Uh, and with that, I'd like to start with our first panelist, uh, Dr. Alexandra Kazimierczak. Uh, Alexandra, uh, you are a climate change and health expert at the European Environmental Agency, EEA, um, where you coordinated the European Climate and Health uh, Observatory. So Alexandra, um, the countdown report that um, Kim's presentation also shows that the health impacts of climate change are are really acutely felt across Europe already, right? With temperatures in Europe warming at twice the rate of the global average, and with European health systems remaining quite poorly adapted to climate change related health impacts. So my first question to you, Alexander, is would you be able to share your thoughts on how resilient and how well adapted European health systems actually are uh, right now to be able to deal with the growing impacts of, of climate change and health? Would you be able to provide us with a bit of a, a snapshot? Oh. Thank you, Apple, for the introduction and many thanks to, to, to Rachel and Kim for inviting me. I, I can only express my uh, uh, amazement and, uh, and gratitude for the, for the report and the ongoing collaboration uh, of the European Climate and Health Observatory with the Lancet Countdown in Europe. So, so many thanks for that. Hmm. How resilient the health systems are in, in Europe? Well, I guess that's... Uh, in most countries, the, the health systems are already quite pressed, and uh, anything that would require more healthcare, either in terms of treating physical illnesses or, or mental uh, implications uh, added by climate change, would be an additional burden. Um, I've just come across uh, a paper um, uh, published by Susanna Viegas and, and her colleagues about um, the um, heat wave implications on the hospitalizations in Portugal. And they result in 19% increase in hospitalizations. So you can imagine this nearly one fifth 
higher burden on the healthcare system that is posed by um, heat waves. We see uh, literature about the project that uh, impacts uh, on mental health as well. For example, one of the sort of more neglected areas of, uh, of healthcare and just the coastal flooding is expected to bring in another 5 million additional cases of mild depression by the end of the century. So that's absolutely staggering. Um, so these are just two examples, but of course the, the, the impacts are likely to be much more broad ranging. And uh, looking at the health systems, in uh, 2022, we looked at the national adaptation policies and national climate, uh, health strategies of the European countries. And what we found was that health um, was covered to a much higher extent in the national climate policies than climate was covered uh, by the national health strategies, which sort of shows that the uh, planning for climate adaptation in uh, health systems really needs to play, play a catch up. Uh, what we also found was that uh, a lot of the um, actions that are being planned through the um, uh, health strategies on, uh, on climate are more about more research, awareness raising, rather than, for example, the more concrete actions of making the infrastructure more resilient. And what we see in terms of the infrastructure is that half of the hospitals in European cities are located in a strong urban heat island effect areas. So the areas that are likely to be two degrees or more warmer uh, than, uh, than the uh, regional average. So that sort of shows that they are additionally pressed and they need to be more resilient. Sadly, we don't know much about the overall preparedness of the, of the hospitals and healthcare facilities. Um, we see some good examples, for example, uh, through the Life Resistal project, uh, which is focused on bringing nature-based solutions to, um, to, the, to the hospitals. Um, maybe one more thing to say about the, the preparedness and the resilience of uh, health systems in Europe is about the healthcare workforce, the preparedness of nurses and doctors uh, to deal with the implications of climate change. Um, a few months ago, I spoke to them, uh, young and enthusiastic people from the International Federation of Medical Students Associations, and they told me that according to the survey from uh, 2020, only in a quarter of medical schools in Europe, climate change is firmly on the curricula. Uh, so that sort of shows that uh, it's still not a subject that is very widely covered. But what we see is a lot of appetite. For, for knowledge among uh, doctors and nurses, there's a lot of interest among the public health professionals in the climate uh, health education and training. We can see that in the uh, sort of interest of, in the ongoing courses, uh, for example. Or for example, initiatives like the uh, Nurses Challenge, uh, Climate Challenge in uh, Europe, where twice the number of nurses was educated as as uh, expected. So I think that, you know, we're not there yet, but we see a lot of uh, promising uh, movement to make the health systems uh, more resilient. And for example, countries like Finland or Sweden or Ireland or North Macedonia have specific uh, climate adaptation plans for the health sector. And we also see that the Budapest Declaration of WHO Europe that was signed in July last year, there is a very firm commitment for the countries to develop national heat adapt uh, health adaptation plans. Sorry, so that's also showing the, the commitment and the movement. So not quite there yet, but I think going in the right direction. Thanks so much, Alexandra. And yeah, it's interesting. I mean, it's important to point out that indeed the health workforce is really the, the backbone of any functioning health system, but especially climate resilient one. And it reminds me that um, a WHO review that recently came out of uh, all the NDC, all the national climate plans, identified health workforce as the least um, uh, or current health adaptation priority. Um, so when we're looking at health adaptation across the health system, across all these national climate plans, health workforce was sort of least prioritized. So yeah, I think it really resonates with what, what you, you've just said. Thanks so much, Alexandra. Um, I would now like to turn our, uh, to our second panelist, Dr. Sarah, with me. Um, Sarah uh, is an assistant professor uh, in the Center on Climate Change and Planetary Health at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. Uh, and she's a personal hero of mine, and I'm sure of many on the call. 
Uh, she was the lead author of the seminal 2015 Rockefeller Lancet Commission Report on Planetary Health, and she's also lead author of the 2023 Lancet Pathfinder Commission Report. Uh, so, Sarah, uh, the 2024 Countdown in Europe report contains a large section on mitigation actions and health care benefits, and, and, and Kim presented um, quite a bit on them just, just now, um, including a range of indicators on the health benefits that are to be gained in our energy systems, on air pollution, uh, and through the promotion of sustainable diets. And, and you, Sarah, you were the lead author of the recent Lancet Pathfinder report, which maps systematically what the pathways are that lead from mitigation actions to certain health care benefits. So I'd love to ask you, could you explain briefly what some of the major pathways are to through which we can through which health care benefits are delivered from climate action? Uh, and do any of these sort of co-benefit indicators in the Canton report highlight where health gains from climate policies are are already being made? Any any sort of good examples in Europe or elsewhere? Yeah, thanks, Arthur. Uh, yeah, so I mean, Pathfinder is basically like a sort of sister publication almost to to the countdown. So whereas they they look a lot of the indicators, what we really tried to do with Pathfinder was to look at the 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 how and the what is what being done in terms of mitigation actions and the potential range of health care benefits. Uh, and what we did was we looked across the modeled evidence, so all the systematic reviews that have been done on climate mitigation and health. But also importantly, try to look at the implemented actions. So what's being monitored and evaluated in, in the real world, because we've heard a lot about that implementation gap that's existing at the moment. So how can we sort of address that by thinking more about the healthcare benefits for mitigation? Uh, and what we found really from the modeled evidence was that there are three main pathways and some of those have been touched on a little bit already. So we really see that the, the healthcare benefits from mitigation are delivered through reductions in air pollution, improved diets and increased physical activity. And these come from mitigation actions, including things like obviously um, transitioning away from fossil fuels towards renewable energy, which improves air quality, which leads to potentially lower rates of cancer, reduced respiratory diseases and reduced cardiovascular diseases. Uh, things like walking and cycling, which obviously increases physical activity. So promoting that, promoting uh, switches to public transport and, and modal shifts away from car use. And that physical activity really can help to promote better mental health, better physical health, lower rates of obesity, and again, improving things like cardiovascular disease. And again, shifting away from um, diets that are high in uh, red and processed meats obviously has big impacts for the environment, for reducing emissions, uh, but switching towards diets that are more plant forward, so higher in fruit and vegetables, can really help to, uh, again, reduce rates of obesity and improve health. Um, and we found really good evidence for those. So the biggest benefits you see to the climate come from things like decarbonisation of electricity generation. The biggest benefits to health really come from things like changes into more sus uh, sustainable, healthy diets. Um, and obviously, you see really big, big gains to both uh, health and the environment from modal shifts in transport as well. Um, those were the three main path by, pathways by which we found the most robust evidence that exists. We know that there's really good um, background evidence on things like nature-based solutions as well. So that's increased access mm. to green and blue spaces and uh, things like improved retrofits for buildings with improved ventilation as well can also have huge benefits. But we're really still lacking particularly good evidence on the health care benefits from those sorts of actions in a holistic way. So we don't mm. really know what the climate and health benefits together for those can be. Right, right. And can I ask one follow-up question on this? So an, an interesting finding from the, the countdown report as well is that if we design our mitigation actions in a, in a more socially just way, they can also reduce inequities in, in, in some of these key health impact pathways, including air pollution, mm. physical activity from active transport, healthy diets, like you pointed out. So would you be able to give a few sort of concrete examples of climate mitigation actions that uh, or yeah, real life examples, if possible, that have not only considered health care benefits, but have also considered the sort of social justice and equity aspects in, in, in how they were designed. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of there are a lot of potential inequities from mitigation actions, unless they're well designed from the start to think about all sectors of society. Um, there are challenges when you're designing transport systems, especially with the big shift to EVs. This is not something that's sustainable. 
Um, in places like Buenos Aires, they've really thought about the accessibility to, to reach out to create more sustainable transport systems that link even smaller communities and thinking about the accessibility element as well. So not just getting people onto bikes, but thinking about how, you know, disabled people, old people, everybody can really access those systems. And also thinking about things like access for safety. So encouraging women to feel safe reusing pub public transport and cycle systems. So you really have to take that holistic view if you want to, to think about how to address that. Um, there's a really good example from Australia where they've tried to weatherize and weatherize and retrofit homes for social housing. So improving thermal comfort and mental health benefits as well and reducing costs. So there's some really great examples all, all around the world. It's just capturing those and capturing the benefits and we need more of those. Uh, we do have more on our Pathfinder website. So if people want to go there, they can have a look and I'll put a link. So if anyone's got any good examples they'd like us to feature, then we'd be very happy to feature those as well, because it's really by sharing these good examples and sort of teaching people how to evaluate and, and think about these equity implications that we can really start to sort of accelerate progress on mitigation and health. Thanks so much, Sharon. It, um, those are really interesting examples, uh, but it does strike me that you've just given an example of Argentina and Australia and um, not necessarily European example. And that might be because the evidence is not necessarily there. It doesn't mean that there's no good examples out there. Uh, yeah. But I do it's think that might be it's just, Yeah, it's capturing yeah. it in that holistic way where you're thinking about what are the mitigation benefits? What are the health benefits? What are the equity benefits? We need more people to share those examples and to measure and try to evaluate them so we can kind of communicate that out and give people these mm. additional sort of yeah, examples. That would be a, a good challenge, I think, for ourselves to, to also have better um, European examples of where both health and social justice um, aspects have been central in the design of, of climate uh, policies. Uh, thanks so much, Sarah. Um, and with that, I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Chetna Charma next. Uh, so Chetna is a medical doctor and academic clinical fellow at University College London Institute for Global Health. Uh, and Chetna is also part of the Race and Health Collective, uh, an interdisciplinary research and advocacy group that works to analyze the discriminatory structures that impact health. Um, and so Chetna, you've worked with many groups uh, that we would identify as most affected people in areas, MAPA. Uh, for people who are not familiar with it. Um, and in your work, you you often take sort of a justice-led approach that really centers around the perspective, the resilience and the solutions building of most affected people in areas. And so I'd, I'd love to hear uh, sort of your reflections of, of what, what Sarah has just uh, pointed out to as well. But when I read the Kantan report and, and also Kim pointed out in her, in her presentations, it was quite striking to me that there's still incredibly limited engagement with key issues of equality, equity, and justice as they relate to climate health. And so I, I, I couldn't wait to ask for your views on, on this particular thing. So how is that even possible that the focus and engagement on equity and justice is just remains so low? And a second question wrapped into that, I'd love to ask for your reflections of, of, of what, what Sarah and, and also Alexander have pointed out um, around centering both health and equity in how we mitigate and adapt to climate change. So I'd love to hear from you if you have sort of additionals or concrete examples that you can build on, on from what Sarah just said. Of course, um, and thank you, Arthur, and thank you to the team as well for a, a huge effort in this report. Um, I think the first thing that's important to say is that if we're truly focusing on equity, which is the understanding that these differences in the health outcomes result from unjust policies and societal structures, then any attempt to address that has to employ a different process because otherwise we're operating in the same way within an unjust structure and we just risk perpetuating these unjust health outcomes. So it is important to go beyond sort of simply prioritizing but rather centering the most affected people in areas. And that starts with a real critical introspection of who is in the room, um, who is heard when we're understanding level of need, um, environmental damages, whose voices are centered in policy making and whose are excluded and who have access so that their solutions are the ones that are listened to and resourced appropriately. So these mitigation and adaptation measures do really need to be that locally appropriate and context specific format um, in order for them to be more likely to succeed. And as we've sort of heard, the, the adaptation and imp implementation plans are lacking um, progress. So we know internationally funded interventions often aimed at adaptation and vulnerability reduction can inadvertently reinforce um, and create new sources of vulnerability, um, whether it's through a lack of 
clear understanding of the vulnerability context, so not appropriately capturing the processes through which particular groups are impacted, so um, data on race, gender, disability, class, um, and in inequitable um, stakeholder participation as well, so in both design and implementation. And sometimes you have these sort of seemingly participatory processes while uh, local communities and marginalized people will still have limited say over the process through which that adaptation response is framed, defined, and then ultimately implemented and evaluated. Um, and then you can also often have a lack of critical engagement with how the success is defined. And it kind of links to the evaluation um, that you were talking about, Sarah, about how do we go about ensuring successful criteria are deemed by the people who we're trying to impact um, and promote better health amongst. Um, so there are some routes towards addressing it, but it, it's not sort of a clear, there's no real clear framework because there's inherent complexity in this. So um, shifting the terms of engagement between researchers, practitioners and, and local populations. So in our um, Envisioning Environmental Equity project, we used case studies and testimony along with policy analysis and alongside quantitative me methods, because those qualitative methods are much better suited to an analyzing injustice in depth. And then also sort of shifting this a science policy interface to more of a knowledge policy interface. And that really helps to integrate um, diverse knowledge forms and interests. Um, and then really expanding what we mean by vulnerability to encompass a global context. So I know we're focusing on Europe in this report, but the drivers of vulnerability go beyond obviously these sco the scope of, of artificial borders. So understanding how instead of designing projects that attempt to change practices of, of minoritized people or marginalized populations, we should be placing at the center of our adaptation objectives, learning processes within org organizations, within marginalized populations, so that we're actually understanding and learning about what these drivers are and using that qualitative dimension to build resilience. Um, so, I mean, I can give an, a bit more of an example of a, a local example. So in, I'm based in the UK and a, an example of addressing climate breakdown, but with the speed and scale that's demanded, um, relying on climate adaptation and mitigation at the local level is, is being prototyped and practiced by a group called Civic Square. So they really firmly rooted their work in the local level at neighborhood state uh, level and civic society to be responsive to planetary constraints of material consumption, energy use, but while also acknowledging what are the exact impacts here and how can we impact, how can we influence them? So they've, they have some fundamentals for their work, including um, rewiring neighborhood resource flows to encourage longevity and biomaterial and reuse as a default. Um, building a physical and infrastructure um, for just just local energy transitions and then supporting neighborhoods to maximize the space and the materials that already exist. So part of it is sort of acknowledging this epistemic injustice or so understanding that which knowledges are heard, legitimizing given space is a crucial element. Um, and then, as we know, you know, indigenous populations have an expansive knowledge of ecosystems, of sustainability, and research and science is beginning to understand and value that. Um, the IPCC spoke about the importance of indigenous knowledge, um, and particularly in agricultural adaptation, food systems, land degradation, and they they can all inform these land based mitigation adapt adaptation measures we're talking about. But crucially, it's it's the process through which we go about implementing them and ensuring we're equitable in our process through which we're trying to bring forward health equity, if that makes sense. Thanks so much, Atna. And if you have a link to the, the specific example you gave, feel free to pop it in the chat. It would be, that would be great. And, and um, some of the areas you mentioned also prompted me to think about how the Lancet countdown report has also improved sort of its, its equity um, lens, if you will, to, to many of its indicators, and that's one step, but then you pointed out that there's many other ways to actually improve how how voices are being heard and how space is created, and including case studies and, and other areas, and uh, ensuring that there's successful criteria um, in something that's inherently complex and inherently hard to uh, put a border around is, is something I took away from what you've just said. Uh, so I'd love to come back to that in the Q&A uh, in just a bit. Uh, but next, I'd like to ask a question to Anne and then uh, Remco as well, our two last uh, panelists. So Anne Stauffer is the Deputy Director and Strategic Lead of the Health and Environment Alliance, HEAL, which is an alliance of over 80 member organizations working for better health and for a healthier environment. And so Anne has been working on environmental climate health issues at the European level for over 15 years, but has also played an important role at the global level 
uh, including as a board member for the Global Climate Health Alliance and, and a member of the WHO Civil Society Working Group on Climate Health. So, Anne, you've, you've worked on climate health policy, uh, especially in the European context, for, for over a decade. Um, and the Countdown Report comes at uh, an important time, an interesting time, a few weeks away from the European elections. Um, so I would love to ask you, in this context of your upcoming European elections, how high on the political agenda at the moment are, are health and climate change? Do you think they will play an important role in the political discourse? Are they already playing an important role? And how um, in, in, will that play a role in how people vote climate health? How, how does that show up? Thanks very much, Arthur, and uh, thanks also to the Lancet Countdown for giving me the opportunity to be part of this uh, panel discussion and this launch. And congratulations very much on this latest uh, edition of the of the European uh, report, which is uh, so so key uh, to bring forward uh, and have this evidence uh, from the Lancet Countdown as a as a really unique uh, interdisciplinary co collaboration. Uh, in in many ways, uh, I think also in especially in our time, if I look at the European level where um, there's a lot of uh, fear happening, a lot of emotionalization um, of debates. Uh, I think it's so it's so crucial to have this, this um, hard data. Uh, and I think also very much what you presented here today echoes recent findings, uh, including the, uh, the recent first ever climate risk assessment that was put out uh, by the EU. And we were pleased to see that actually health was one of five uh, clusters identified. So really that uh, that showed the importance um, in looking uh, into climate, health and climate um, uh, concerns and measures. And I think also what, uh, what you showed here today very much uh, echoes the concern of people across uh, Europe, uh, where we know from Eurobarometers and other surveys that people, the majority, the overwhelming majority of people out there are quite concerned about the impacts um, that they're witnessing and they're experiencing and suffering from in the European region uh, because of the developments that we have we've talked about here. And so on, on this background, Arthur, since you ask about the upcoming EU elections in, in, in three weeks time, you would think that actually climate uh, climate action and also health concerns should be uh, top front and center of the policy measures that are being uh, discussed. Unfortunately, uh, that's my negative message uh, here today, but I also have a positive one. Unfortunately, that's not the case. We're um, to the contrary seeing uh, an increasing resistance on climate measures uh, blocking, uh, and that is very different to what happened actually five years ago, where we um, saw um, following the EU elections, we saw the uh, launch of the EU Green Deal uh, with the goal of setting, of making the EU uh, the first climate neutral continent by 2050, and really a range of measures, laws uh, that we have seen in the past years. But already uh, we have witnessed a, um, a growing resistance. Uh, there's currently a key law on nature restoration uh, stalled with the member states. And you would think, again, this, is, this should be a no-brainer that we need to protect and actually restore our life-supporting systems, uh, which you also know from other assessments are under major threat already from climate change. But uh, this is not being recognized by policymakers. Um, and we also have seen in the draft um, of the EU strategic agenda, this is a process that, that our EU leaders, our heads of states, are currently working on to be adopted by the end of June, so after the EU elections, uh, that actually health is not mentioned at all in this draft uh, EU strategic agenda, and climate change uh, is... If it's given a mere lip service, I would say it's mentioned, but it's sort of kind of in, you know, under under a priority and it's sort of, oh, yes, we have to somehow deal with, you know, what will happen, what we'll see happening with, with climate change. The focus is very much on security. The focus is on competitiveness, uh, but not in the sense, I think everyone here in this in this virtual room would agree that uh, security, health and, and uh, climate action are actually at the core of security concerns, and they're also at the core of competitiveness issues, because otherwise, you know, with a sick population, how can you be productive um, and competitive? But that's that's currently not being recognized. Um, but it's not it's not too late. That's my that's my positive message today: is that it needs 
the engagement of all of us uh, here uh, interested and concerned about this topic. So from the scientists to the individual health experts, but also to the health organizations, because um, our speaking up or raising our voice and highlighting how we need to see health protection and climate action at the center of EU policies can make a difference. So this is also very much my invitation uh, to all of you to go out and vote uh, in the upcoming elections, um, as we um, as we will, you know, all the polls predict a move to the right. Um, but yeah, if all of us work together and come together, we can prevent this and we can really give the message that health protection and climate change need to be at the center of the EU's policies for the next five years. Thank you. Thanks, and yeah, very interesting reflection. Also thinking about security uh, really becoming a number one priority for many politicians and how that relates with climate, climate security and, and health security as mm. well. Thinking about energy security and how we can use that framing as well to our, to our advantage really. I'd love to come back to this a little bit more and also maybe hear from uh, Alexander on, on those reflections because, because like you said, there are, a lot of climate policies coming out from from EU institutions as well, and I, I do feel climate health is is gaining a lot of uh, attention there, but it doesn't seem to be reflected in um, public engagement potentially or, or public um, prioritization of climate health just yet. So I'd love to get Alexandra's and and, and others' reflections uh, on this in the Q and A. Um, but I'm conscious of time, so I'll uh, first ask a question to Remco as well. Um, so Dr. Remko van der Pass uh, is a senior research associate at the Center for Planetary Health Policy, and he's a lecturer on global health policy at the Institute of Tropical Medicine in Antwerp. So um, Remko, I'd like to ask you a question on <clears throat> sort of building on what Andrew said on the relevance of global momentum and global diplomacy. And, and there's a few questions in the chat also asking about international fora. Um, so we see climate health really gaining momentum in the international fora. We had the COP28 climate conference last year where we had 150 countries who sort of endorsed uh, a climate health declaration, political declaration. We also have uh, very soon the World Health Assembly coming up where a resolution on climate health will very likely be adopted, really mandating and, and empowering WHO to take more action on this as well. So do you think that these more global discussions provide also an opportunity to strengthen also, perhaps to strengthen the equity and social justice uh, angle, um, for example, by providing um, sort of a stronger um, voice to disadvantaged countries as well, and, and by pointing out the, the disproportionate um, impact that the EU has on, on, on climate globally. So I'm just wondering if you could reflect on that sort of global mm, yes. momentum that's being built, but also thinking about the equity lens in, in those fora. Thank you, uh, Arthur, and, and really great to be here. Um, important that the uh, report is there so we can build our policy debates on it. For me, so the, 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 the justice and international responsibility elements are crucial to make our way, uh, to find a way forward. Um, and I have two main, main things that I would like to share. First, regarding the international responsibility. So health as part of the climate negotiations is now better, better on uh, better, recognized it's also now there's a there's an upcoming resolution with uh, with the world health assembly to uh, to really make it happen so it's it's some it, the the declaration is one thing so you can you can have a, a policy intention and you see that uh, there is more attention uh, on that from many countries but in the end from the governance and accountability perspective it has to be followed by by finance and structured uh, investments in shifting a transition in the, the common but differentiated responsibility uh, required to uh, address loss and damage and reparations that are required to make the adaptation and mitigation possible uh, that remain very underfinanced. And this is where the, the difficulty comes in that uh, uh, the, the, the actual policies that are agreed upon, the finance that ought to come, is not really uh, matched by, uh, by, by actual finance or by actual commitments. And this is what we, at least from a European perspective, and there's, there is, uh, um, there's debates also regarding out accountability of transnational corporations. Huh? There's, a U there's a UN treaty on uh, the function of transnational corporations to be developed and whether they are, uh, whether they are accountable for their sustainability behavior. Uh, there's questions about tax, uh, international tax adjustment, so that we have the public finance available to invest in the in the just transition. And we see here that 
while there is on the climate and health health side, Europe takes certain positions, it sh takes that position away or shies away from it more on the trade and financing, international financing side, so to say. So there's incoherence. Huh? So um, for us, I think the international climate and health community, we need to look across different sectors to really hold European countries accountable there. And there's quite some uh, ambiguity, so to say, or call it even hypocrisy. And I think a lot of uh, southern countries would call for uh, reforms also more in the international financial institutions, IMF, World Bank, relations to debt restructuring and debt cancellation, etc. So for me, we can't engage fully with this climate and health agenda if we also not address that other more structural, let's say political economy um, uh, debate, which is a difficult one, but I think it's unavoidable from the, from a solidarity perspective. So that comes a bit for me to the second message. The second message is that if we want to um, quickly go to net zero and quickly address the health impacts of climate change, and we need to address the way how we organize our economies, there needs to be a great transformation of, of how our economies are structured. The healthcare sector is part of that. And by and large, let's say this more capitalist mode of production and consumption that we're having in Europe, it, it's unsustainable footprint, footprint wise and, and the burden that we bring on the planets, both, both ecologically as well also the social harms that are being done. Also historically, it can't be sustained. And that's what is politically so difficult is that we try to sustain an old economic way of doing things which means outsourcing our, our, our pollution and greenhouse gas em emissions, but also importing cheap, uh, uh, cheap labor and cheap uh, uh, products. And to engage, for instance, with uh, we use uh, at the center often the, the donut economics model, staying within planetary boundaries, uh, ensuring social foundations, but the economic uh, shift where we take a, a kind of a post-growth analysis, which would mean that we do not focus anymore on on growth or growthism per se, and that's often still what Europe is about in its global gateway and competitiveness, as as Anna said, but rather move to a more redistrib redistribution and an ecological way of of doing things. But it's an un it's an unpopular. Uh, um, Political message, because a, a, a lot of the of a lot of the political constituencies they don't feel secure that then their needs are being redressed, and this really then links to to redistribution in the end. It's about taxation, the pollution, taxation, the wealthy that have profited from from the from the economic systems as it is now. Um, and I I feel that we as a let's say climate and health community can engage much more with that difficult but necessary political debates to make it uh, to make it happen thanks so much Remco, and uh, thanks so much also for bringing finance into this question i, th I think that is absolutely uh, crucial but even finance in the broadest sense as in uh, re restructuring our economies as a whole um in the meantime we've received quite a few questions from um listeners listening in so i'd like to um, start with a few of those questions um, we had a question from Isatu Tsar who asked, can you, could you discuss any sort of the regional disparities or differences in the impacts of climate change and health as were revealed by the report? So any sort of regional differences, uh, disparities, uh, both regional and maybe also in, uh, per population group. And I was wondering maybe, Alexandra, if, if you would want to give that, that one a first step, any sort of regional differences in, for any of the particular indicators? Yes, I, I, I think that uh, Kim uh, summarized it in, in her presentation already. And uh, what we see is that uh, Southern Europe is a hotspot for a lot of the health impacts, uh, heat waves, uh, wildfires. Uh, also, we've seen uh, really devastating flooding in the in the last years, uh, hitting the uh, Southern Europe. Uh, Lesh uh, as well, as, as mentioned uh, by Kim. 
what we see in in other uh, regions, for example, around the, the Baltic Sea and uh, in parts uh, of the um, in in the countries surrounding uh, around the the North Sea as well, is then increasing uh, suitability for Vibrion infections. Uh, and in the Northern Europe, the increasing suitability for, for ticks. So I think that we can see some, some clear regional patterns um, there in terms of the impacts that, uh, that, could be, uh, that are already ongoing and that, uh, that could be expected. Um, but um, what we also know is that uh, it's, it's not so really clear cut and um, one of the indicators looking at the population exposure to, to droughts and water scarcity um, is actually showing that it's uh, nearly a third of the European population might be facing water scarcity in, in summer. And some of the work of the European Environment Agency is showing that some of the most water scarce river basins are actually, for example, located not just in the south of Europe, but also in, in Germany, in the Netherlands, in, in Poland, where the water abstraction is really um, exceeding the, 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 the water resources uh, and uh, in this way exposing the population, but also agriculture industry and so on to, to, to water scarcity. Thanks so much, uh, Alexandra. Um, and if any of the other speakers want to sort of build on that, feel, feel free. But otherwise, I'll add a second question here that Mechtild posed, and that might potentially be for also for Chetna or Sarah. Uh, Mechtild has asked, with the report's focus on equity and at-risk groups, I'd be particularly interested in what the report says about health impacts of climate change on children and youth, both their physical and mental health, and how we can ensure that this group receives the adequate attention and care when it comes to climate-induced impacts on their health also thinking about intergenerational uh, equity. I was wondering, maybe Chetna, would, would you be comfortable starting on that one? Thinking about the children and health, uh, children and youth as a particular, a particularly disadvantaged group as well. Uh, yeah, sure, I can start. Um, so my, we know that children are more vulnerable when it comes to climate related risks such as heat, um, and also of mental health. And that's one of the clear sort of indicators where we do need to make sure we're enabling a different type of approach and we're taking a different type of, oh, sorry, <laughs> addressing the themes in a different um, just and equitable format. So taking a participatory approach with children and young people is one element um, through which we can approach it and through which we can actually address their needs. But it's it's really important the way that it's done. So we have to make sure that there's enough safeguarding. Um, it's done through a way of building trust, um, as should be done with all community engaged work. Um, and with the intergenerational component, this is another factor that is sort of gaining more understanding that actually experiencing any form of trauma, um, whether it's climate related migration, displacement, we've seen has impacts on um, both the family, but also of children and in, in offspring. So actually, how are we doing research and engaging with policy that acknowledges the impacts, not just of the current generation, but also subsequent generations um, with a lot of the political um, changes that we're seeing. And I think this is a great example of how health has to be seen as inherently political. So when we're looking at different immigration policies, we're seeing different formats of how people are governed and how movement is deemed acceptable or unacceptable. There's a real health argument in there. There's a real, real focus for health and they need health to have to have a central focus in it um, because otherwise we risk causing a large uh, impact on a large number of people um, and it's going to lead to many, many unjust inequalities down the line. So actually making that health argument within politics, within immigration is so key. And we know that as a result of climate change, we're gonna see a, a, st a steep increase in climate related migration and displacement. And it's about how we provide a framework to support that. Mm, thanks Chetna. Sarah, any, any sort of further reactions on that? Yeah, yeah, that was a that was a great summary, Chenna. I think you know it, it is worth sort of emphasizing that we are still trying to understand some of the the near term impacts from health, and and that our understanding of things like the impacts of air pollution on children's health is is growing all the time, and and the picture is getting worse. So you know we need to take that precautionary principle now in terms of phasing out fossil fuels to to protect to protect the lives of children 
now and in the future. And I think, you know, it, it's in all our interest to to create a, a healthier, more active, mentally, you know, mentally well, sustainable world for our children. Why is that seen as a bad thing? Why do we look at the, the negative impacts of, of these mitigation actions as restrictions? Why can't they be framed as opportunities for our children to go up in sustainable, clean, healthy environments that, that nurture, you know, all aspects? Mm of their well-being you know it's it's just a matter of how you look at it really yeah and and building on that and i'd love to uh, ask you a question because sarah you mentioned um air pollution in particular and i, I know and you've, you've done quite a lot of work on that as well um and yeah, like you, you mentioned sarah that you is making strides in improving air quality but we're finding out just how bad it actually is um, more and more there's still more evidence so i was wondering if you could highlight and how how do we sort of center especially disadvantaged group in, um, in groups in 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 our air quality efforts um would be great to hear from you. Sure, I'd be happy uh, to talk. Actually, this fits also with um, what I would have responded on a question of what uh, what can we all do? What kind of health en health engagement is possible? And I can uh, briefly speak about our experience from working on the updating of the EU's clean air standards. That was uh, a several years uh, process, uh, which we're at the finish line. Uh, we're not there yet. We need one more vote uh, from the EU member states. Uh, but this is a process where really health engagement and the health voice has made such a difference uh, in actually making sure that, you know, the new standards are closer to what WHO and what the science recommends. We're not there. Uh, we here has always advocated for full alignment with WHO. So if you want 100% reflecting um, the science, this unfortunately wasn't possible in the end. But I think the, the package that we're looking at ha has a huge, huge potential for uh, protecting everyone's health and especially protecting those um, most at risk, uh, including children, and actually children were also key focus. So you know we had a we had a record number of health experts and health groups active on this EU policy process throughout the whole time, and that's also what made it uh, an impact. Um, and Heal and many others have have highlighted the new evidence, Sarah, that you were talking about, just how bad uh, the the impact is of air pollution on children. Uh, we've also highlighted uh, the unhealthy link between social inequality uh, and air pollution um, so you know that that focus really on vulnerability and on inequality was very very present um, also with policy makers uh, even though as we know we're lacking some of the evidence when it comes to the social uh, the social and air pollution um, inequalities but you know raising that uh, that from from what we know, we know that there 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 is this unhealthy link, uh, and highlighting that has really um, helped policymakers. Also, uh, when we look at the European context, I think it's really important to highlight that we have a a, a huge uh, difference uh, or in, an unequal unequal. Um, so inequality between Eastern European member states and Western European member states. Uh, and actually, uh, the negotiating uh, member states in council, they wanted to introduce an exemption which would, have, which would have increased this inequality by giving Eastern European member states more time to reach a new clean air standards. And luckily, because many, many, many health groups and also uh, those affected uh, by air pollution spoke up, so we managed to to avert uh, this exemption. There's another exemption in, but uh, you know, I'm not saying this law is perfect, and it leaves us of all of us with the homework. But uh, clearly, highlighting, uh, and that's also what my recommendation would be for this next new policy cycles: make it real, talk about the impact, talk about people. So highlighting uh, this evidence or bringing also patients. Uh, to the table and highlighting patient stories uh, is key on on building um, political support for more ambitious measures. Over. Thanks, Anne. Yeah, that the health argument for for climate action can, comes out loud and clear, and, and Chet and I also um, raised that. Um, I realize that we're actually almost out of time, so I'd like to go around one more time, and we have quite a general question uh, that we've actually we've received this question several different ways. Uh, somebody's asked, what role can individuals, communities, and healthcare professionals play in addressing the health impacts of climate change as highlighted by this uh, report? So it's sort of, I think you've just answered that question, Anne, um, but I'd love to go around the, the room one more time, sort of answering that. What what can we do, uh, especially as sort of the health community? What should we be prioritizing first and foremost? So I wonder if in just a couple of sentences, you could sort of say, this is the one thing that you should really be 
prioritizing or one of the many things. And maybe Remco, I'll start with you. Um, if somebody asks you what role can individuals, communities, and healthcare professionals play in addressing the health impacts of climate change, what would I, be your sort of number yeah, one? Yeah, I was, um, um, as part of this, this uh, post-growth economic thinking, there was a debate about what healthcare professionals can do. So there's Tim Jackson and others, they write about the care economy. And basically the argument is, if we need to go into this just transition, the transformation, the healthcare uh, sector is crucial. Um, we can have a leading position in showing that a transformation is possible. Uh, and if you think about it, it is, it is quite well possible to be much more community focused, to shift from, from the more curative treatment side to a, to a prevention and health promotion side to organize healthcare structures at, at, uh, at the primary healthcare level, not only for, 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 let's say, clinical care, but also to have a social function, uh, working much more on, on, on educational measures as well. So that shift that we, that we can, can make, because we are huge as a healthcare sector with all the healthcare workers that are there, is, is, is rich. Um, and I think this is something we can, uh, we can start working on, basically. Yeah. I love that one. Thanks, Remco. Uh, Alexander, can I put you on the spot next for the same question? So, then, well, the, the, the healthcare professionals, the doctors and nurses are the most uh, trusted profession, uh, as opposed to politicians, which are at the bottom. Uh, so I think they can really play a key role in uh, working both with the patients, uh, educating themselves on the um, risks associated with climate change and what they can do, but also uh, influencing the, the the politicians. And I think that you know for them, for the for them individuals such as uh, such as uh, you and I, what can be done, and it's been said already, vote <laughs> and vote sensibly. For those who can uh, actually make a change, and I think another um, another piece of advice would be look after your neighbor, look after you know those who are um, elderly or vulnerable or disabled when the heat wave comes, when the bad weather comes. Uh, just uh, keep an eye on them. I, I I love that last point, especially because it points out that the health community is not just healthcare professionals, but it's much broader than that, and there's many different roles that uh, we can all play in, in, in the care economy. So I, I think that builds really nicely on what the Remco just highlighted as well. Um, Sarah, can you go next? Yeah, I, th I think vote is the, is the strongest message that you can give. I mean, politicians love to put the emphasis on the individual, but there are lots of actions and, and, and ways forward that you can advocate for that, that put the onus back on, on, on politicians and, and companies and businesses to do better, I think, you know, to switch away from fossil fuels, you know, whether it's pensions divesting, you know, whether it's cities taking holistic actions that just go beyond the incremental. I think we need to be scaling up action and quickly. So you need to be asking what is, it's beyond just pledging, it's doing as well. So we need to be holding, you know, decision makers and those taking action accountable at all levels to say you know you've said you're going to do this are you measuring mm. it what are you doing how are you doing mm. from incremental to systematic change that makes that makes a lot of sense uh chetna the last word <laughs> sure um i think i mean i'd agree with everything that's been said already and as the health community is such a broad range of skills and experience so there's a real organizing power there and i would say i'd say two things so firstly there's, there's a real need for advocacy around both ensuring loss and damage funds are rapidly implemented, but also it's taken through a reparative justice framework. And that can take many forms. So it's divesting, divesting from extractive industries, transferring technology and wealth and resources, um, advocating for debt cancellation, giving land back, um, a climate global uh, stabilization fund that is made according to responsibility. So there are lots of different ways that as members of the health community, we can advocate for a transformative project. And then the other thing I would say is, is a crucial important factor is if we're thinking about justice in how we study and monitor climate and health, it means thinking about the whole system and it means critically and understand, understanding things like supply chains, you know, these green solutions that most European governments have set up generous subsidies for wind, windmills, solar pa um, panels, electric cars, 
They're extremely resource intensive because they rely on the mining of uh, metals and minerals such as copper, copper, cobalt, lith lithium, and that largely takes place outside of Europe in formerly colonized localities in the global south. And so Congo produces 70% of the world's cobalt, but it's the second poorest country in the world. Um, cobalt mining is associated with severe environmental degradation, child labor, conflict. And so without understanding and including supply chain analysis in our research, in our data, in our reports, we really risk entrenching that kind of decarbonization divide because the availability of low carbon technologies in, in the global north and in centers of wealth depend on very much unjust flows of min mineral extraction, which only kind of perpetuates that inequality, degradation um, and dependence. So making sure that we have an account of those systems and we're understanding how that flow of transfer um, of resource material works, that's going to be key to making sure that whatever we implement is done in a sustainable way and is done in a just and um, appropriate way. Thanks so much, Chetna. So not just systematic change, but also transformative change and, and, and with a reparative justice lens and, and those those um, synergies we have with with um, our global supply chains. And I'm sorry, I realized I hadn't uh, handed over to you yet. So you have the last word, Anne, sorry. Uh, anything else to add? Well, okay, I'll be very um, brief. Uh, do join us. There is a, a large uh, health and climate movement uh, out there, uh, incredibly uh, inspirational, committed people. Uh, so uh, yeah, join us. Uh, join us now. Um, and, you know, go out and vote, uh, and then uh, let's all work together and and uh, get to work for the next EU policy cycle because we will have some some things to do, and it needs uh, the voice uh, and the engagement of all of us. Amazing. Thanks so much, Anne, uh, Remco, Alexandra, Sarah, and Chetna. Uh, we've, we're out of time. Thanks, everybody, also for all the questions. I think we've tried to answer quite a few of them, and I also saw the countdown. Dean has been answering you in the chat as well. So now I'll, I'll uh, hand over back to uh, Professor, Professor Rachel Lowe. Thanks so much, everyone. Thanks, panelists. Thank you so much to Arthur and all our panelists for that very fascinating discussion and finishing on a positive note of the kind of solutions we can work towards. I now have the great honor to introduce Dr. Omnia Onrani. Uh, thank you for joining us. Um, Omnia was the first official youth envoy for the president of COP27 and the Egyptian Minister of Foreign Affairs. She is a climate change and health policy fellow at Imperial College London and a COP28 envoy for health. Welcome Omnia. Yeah, thank you so much, Rachel, and to everyone for having me. Um, I apologize for the slight noise because I'm currently stuck in the airport, but I'm very excited to join you all. Um, and I think it's a great segue from the incredible panel that was before me when one person specifically asked about the impacts of climate change on young people and children. Um, young people from the age of zero to 24 make up more than 41% of all people alive in the world today. And according to the World Health Organization, no country is sufficiently protecting the health, nor the environment, nor the future of young people today. 89% of young people and children are living in low and middle income countries that are also the most climate vulnerable and that are exposed to the devastating impacts of climate related events, um, both direct and indirectly. And we can see only last year, as it was integrated in the Lancet report, Pakistan witnessed the flooding, which affected more than 33 million people, including children and young people, devastating their healthcare facilities, their schools, their access to um, the healthcare services that they needed. Um, and even this month, at the beginning of the month, we had the flooding taking place in Brazil, which is also the, the host of the UN Climate Summit COP30. And it led so forth to the displacement of over 662,000 people. Um, and many are reported to have been children that are unaccompanied. We cannot find their families. So we can see the devastating impacts of climate change, particularly in the most vulnerable settings. And when we look at other events such as extreme heat um, and its impact, particularly on children and young people, um, the Lancet countdown report shows that on average, when we compare 2005 with 2022, children under the age of one are exposed to 110% of extreme heat, uh, of more days of heat wave, which is not only impacting their physical health, but also their mental health. 
and young people's mental health is being affected by climate change a because of the distress the psychological anxiety that young people face because of extreme weather events or the post traumatic stress disorders because of the aftermath of witnessing a climate related disaster whether it's a hurricane or a flood um, but also there is the fear of the existential crisis and the future threat of climate change on their health on their economic opportunities and access to the resources that many young people want, affecting their determinants of health. And this has been proven in a survey that shows more than 70% of 10,000 young people are experiencing anxiety about climate change, and more than 40% of them, this anxiety is impairing their basic, um, their daily functioning because of their worry about the climate crisis. Um, and at the same time, people who are living with mental health conditions are among the vulnerable populations, especially during the heat because of the psychoactive medication, uh, which impairs the body's ability to adapt to the increasing temperature. So there's also the health of people who are living with mental health challenges that need to be considered. Um, and evidence specifically on the impacts of climate change, particularly on vulnerable groups, on children and young people is yet sparse. Um, even though there are many studies that are collaborating, either, either using social media data, um, particularly for understanding mental health impacts or using surveys, but yet more data is needed to understand both the disproportionate impacts of climate change on uh, children and young people, but also on mental health of the population in Europe and globally. But what we have seen in Europe particularly, which has been so uh, inspiring how many young people have uh, taken uh, their rights to a healthy, safe, and clean environment to litigation across European courts, done by six Portuguese young people, but also in Germany, but also in other uh, countries, uh, calling for the recognition of the rights of young people to a healthy environment, and calling their countries who are backtracking on their climate commitments. Um, and it has been proven by many studies that involving young people in a meaningful a way, particularly in voicing their perspectives and participating in decision making, the creation of climate policies that serves them and their needs is a way of protecting their mental health, of building their psychological resilience because they feel that they are respected, valued, and their inputs are integrated. And this is why in COP27 in Egypt, for the first time in 27 years, a, young, a youth envoy position was created within the presidency team that is responsible for the climate negotiation process. And the, I was fortunate to be in this position to facilitate opportunities for the diverse integration of youth voices uh, directly with negotiators, with ministers, and with the decision makers in the conference. But then in the COP28 uh, in the UAE Climate Summit, this position was permanently institutionalized, which means that every single presidency, every single leader of the negotiation team for the climate discussions is mandated to appoint a young person with a team that is being built right now in the UN office responsible for climate change to support young people's participation in the in climate political spaces. Um, and now in Azerbaijan, there's also a COP a youth champion. And also in the next month, for the first time, there's going to be an expert dialogue between countries to discuss how does climate change affect children? What can countries do to create child responsive uh, climate um, policies and commitments and, and allocate climate finance? Because so far, less than 2.4% of global climate finance goes to policies that are child responses and factors in the impacts of climate change on children and young people's health. But in this dialogue next month, there will be a lot of discussions, a lot of mobilization. And that is when we need the most data that is um, generated by and understood and synthesized by the Lancet countdown from a regional as well as a global perspective to guide the policymakers to make the right decisions based on the data, but also based on the needs of the most vulnerable uh, communities. So I'm very grateful to be part um, of this launch. I um, really encourage everyone to utilize this data with your national governments, with your academic institutions, civil society, but also when doing that, involving young experts uh, to really work together to create a climate that is equitable and just um, for the generations to come. Thank you. Thank you so much, Omnia, for those powerful words. Really appreciate having you here at the launch. I'd like now like to welcome Elena Vishna Malinowska, 
who is currently the head of climate adaptation and resilience at DG um, Climate Action at the European Commission and is leading the strategy for climate adaptation and the Horizon Europe mission on adaptation and the first European climate risk assessment, which was a pleasure to take part in. Thank you so much, Elena. Thank you very much, Rachel. And uh, I have the pleasure, actually, uh, was invited to wrap up this very inspiring webinar. Uh, so um, allow me to thank you wholeheartedly for that. And I like to also thank uh, the authors of the report to you, uh, Rachel and uh, Kim, for all the work uh, you have been doing. Very inspiring. Today's speakers, panelists, for sharing your commitment. I could uh, hear it, although we uh, do discuss uh, online, and the great knowledge and insights uh, that, that, that you shared. Listening to you, I have the impression that indeed climate and health are almost the foundation of what one would uh, call a caring economy. Okay. And let me reassure you uh, that indeed we need to get uh, climate and health into the next strategic uh, direction of uh, the Union. We know that in the past this was not the case, then COVID came, and we shouldn't allow the amnesia to happen yet again. Let me quickly share with you three points. Uh, well, first of all, uh, we have come to appreciate the quality of the Lancet countdown in Europe, because you are also a, a, a core partner in the European Climate and Health Observatory that was mentioned. And this new report is actually a, a testament to the power of multidisciplinary work uh, in partnership. I have been following a little bit the chat. So there was a, a lot of buzz and, and you see that there are indeed uh, uh, people, participants coming from different walks of life, uh, which is uh, extremely uh, appreciated. And also the ability of the Lancet countdown in Europe to mobilize and draw on numerous experts in the field and to pull together highly useful facts and figure. A few things I would like to share with you that struck me or struck a chord with me from the presentations and discussions today, of course, beyond the discussions we had on vulnerabilities and inequalities that uh, come back. But first of all, the sort of figure the twofold increase in heat related death in women compared to men. What does it mean from the climate adaptation perspective? Well, it means that we have to look into gender sensitive adaptation uh, now and also in the future and, and really watch this space. Second, uh, a rather <clears throat> positive message about the cities waking up uh, to doing climate risk assessments, at least the response rate that you shared was rather encouraging. And this is not a, a very easy exercise to embark on for a city with a local authority or the civil servant that normally has to watch after several uh, points in the agenda. Third, uh, before uh, the European elections, we really need to do uh, a job. The, the, the sort of interconnection, health and climate, that doesn't seem to be present among the members of the parliament in the European parliament is indeed disappointing and surprising because the 2022 resolution on drought, fire and other extreme uh, weather phenomena was rather strong on health. So perhaps uh, I, I think, and this is where the reports like yours come uh, very handy, if we had better solid comprehensive figures of how actually much climate related health impacts are increasingly affecting public budgets, our economies and even competitiveness, uh, I mean, if uh, the MEPs do care about people and overloaded hospital, they, they may have even care more if they have a clear idea of how financially uh, and economically uh, this, uh, this, is, uh, this is stunning. And, and, and you've heard also the figure that uh, Alexandra mentioned. And, and, and fourth, maybe, uh, you know, talking a little bit more about mitigation, carbon intensive healthcare actually doesn't mean a better care. That's, that's one of uh, the messages I, I got also. Well, now for 
third, let me uh, speak from my climate adaptation head on. Well, the new Lancet report demonstrates one again <clears throat> the value of being able to track progress on adaptation policies. There's a growing need for this, and we started to work on this more systematically also on our side. In the last few years at the European and international level, we have succeeded to put in place uh, some uh, climate and health policy frameworks, also identifying the climate-related public health risks and defining what needs to happen to be better prepared. But how much have the adaptation policies and actions progressed over time and space? Are they achieving what they set out uh, to do? How effective uh, are they in reducing climate impacts and risks over time? Well, these are actually crucial questions uh, before, because for adaptation policies, like for anything else, what matters are the results and whether we succeeded in solving problems. And I was really pleased to see how much we, we came out from the diagnosis into the solution space, as you also mentioned. And it is also for this reason that our recent communication on managing climate risks, we promised to seek better indicators on progress on resilience including on, in conjunction with other interlinked and relevant indicators to ensure a system approach. And for the same reason, we support and contribute to the so-called BELEM framework, agreed at the recent COP28 in Dubai last December. And this BELEM work uh, program actually sets out within the next two years uh, a process to identify and develop indicators to measure progress towards health-related and other adaptation targets as they are defined in the framework. So we therefore have started working on what hopefully will become a widely agreed set of relevant, credible, robust climate adaptation indicators and of course also on, on health. So these are important processes to which the Lancet countdown in Europe could make a major contribution thanks to your pioneering work on tracking the connections between climate and health policies and their results and impacts. Thank you for having me. Thank you very much, Elena. It's a pleasure to have you here at our launch. So with that, I would like to just take the opportunity to thank everyone so much for making The Lancet Countdown in Europe possible. I'm incredibly grateful to our 69 authors for their expertise and dedication, and especially to Kim for her leadership on the report. I'm grateful to the core team, including the chairs and the working group leads, to the Global Lancet Countdown team, and to uh, IdealAlert and Catalyze for supporting the collaboration and the EU Climate and Health Cluster for developing indicators which are feeding into our report. I'm very grateful to our key stakeholders, the WHO Europe, the European Environment Agency, and all the partners of the European Climate and Health Observatory. I'm very grateful to the Lancet Public Health and to all our speakers and panelists for joining us for this very engaging event. Uh, this is my last year as the director of the Lancet Countdown in Europe. It has been an incredibly rewarding experience, and I look forward to supporting the collaboration both strategically and by providing policy-relevant indicators with the Global Health Resilience Group at the Barcelona Supercomputing Centre. So thank you very much, and please do take the time to read the report, share the findings, share the infographics, Please spread the word and we really hope that we can see some positive movements in mitigating the negative impacts of climate change on health. Thank you so much.